Uh, so I'm going to develop on some points that I made last night about the Corbyn campaign. I'm going to give you a short history of Corbyn and how he became leader of the Labour Party, how socialists like myself, who have previously been, been outside of the Labour Party, uh, approached uh, Corbyn in the context of the British Party system, both historically and today, uh, the general election and why the arguments that made by Labour were successful, and how socialists, what, what you know, how we seek to go forward, and then also maybe some lessons that uh, will maybe be helpful for you. Although, you know, we live in very different countries and very different political systems, so we'll see. Uh, so Corbyn has been an MP for his constituency in Islington North and North London since 1983, and he's been a consistent voice for the left, both inside and outside of Parliament. Even during the drift to the right uh, in the 90s under Kinnock and Blair and Corbyn, uh, Corbyn and a, a small and a small group of left MPs, including the, uh, the now shadow Chancellor John McDonnell, held out and fought for socialist politics within the party, at a time when many socialists were departing from Labour and joining projects such as Socialist Alliance, Respect and Left Unity. They were a constant voice uh, for women's liberation, gay liberation, socialism within, uh, within the Labour Party. And as I mentioned last night, uh, that when Labour was in government, he was the most rebellious Labour backbencher, he disobeyed the party 430 times, um, which is a pretty impressive feat. Um, uh, and so, you know, he was a he wasn't particularly well known outside of sort of left circles or people who were uh, nerdy about politics. Um, so his election to the uh, Labour Party leadership in 2015 was a huge shock. Um, he was let on to the ballot paper by the Blairites in order to broaden the debate with no real expectation that he would win. Uh, so the right-wing MPs would sort of, you know, sign his nomination papers just to, you know, out of goodwill because they knew him or whatever. Um, but, you know, something strange started to happen. People were attracted to his departure from neoliberalism and his uh, unapologetic radicalism. Uh, his, his campaign slogan for that election was straight talking honest politics and, you know, after, uh, five years of the Conservative government, people, you know, that resonated with people. So his campaign took off. Within, uh, you know, weeks of their, his, uh, him getting on the ballot paper, there were huge public rallies, people started flooding into Labour, and membership exploded to half a million. Uh, this uh, terrified the right-wingers within the party, who controlled the party bureaucracy, and they started expelling people en masse on very spurious allegations. Um, so I was just uh, expelled three times for um, being having you know the temerity to support having having support from another party in the past. Um, but still, even though they expelled thousands of people, this still wasn't enough to sort of stop the Corbyn wave. And another, I think, important thing that's, uh, that I should mention is people didn't have the join the party to vote for Corbyn, so they had this system where there was a three pound supporter fee. So if you paid your three pounds, you would get a ballot and you didn't have to join the party. Um, now this system of one member, one vote, or you can also, the system of buying votes, very, was, a, was a different system from what the Labour Party traditionally used. So before the leader was elected by, uh, in to the third, so one third of uh, the vote came from the membership, one third of the vote came from the trade unions, and one third of the vote came from the parliamentary party, the members of parliament. And in 2010, um, they changed this in order to limit the power of the trade unions within the uh, trade union influence within the party. So they switched it to one member, one vote, thinking that this would shore up uh, Blairite power in the party permanently. Uh, so that, yeah, that was a fucking disaster for them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it allowed people to flood into the party. Corbyn did very well with the £3 supporter votes, but he would have won without them anyway. He beat the other three candidates who were a range of sort of <coughs> spineless soft lefties to hard Blairites by a huge margin. Um, and this election for a challenge for revolutionary socialists. Um, most of us have been outside for, of Labour for decades, or if you're, my, if you're my age, all of our political lives. And even those who have maintained their membership of the party have not been particularly active in it, instead choosing to focus on the social movement work. And then there's all, you know, the challenge of being a revolutionary in the Social Democratic Party is a complicated one. But for those seek, of us seeking to build alliances and build broad left politics in Britain, the choice was pretty clear. 
and the vast majority of us spare for a couple of sectarians moved into the Labour Party, or at the very least orientated our work towards the Corbyn movement. <coughs> so it might be worth remarking at this point why Britain has never had a mass force to the left of Labour. Our parliamentary system, our electoral system, uh, operates on a first-past-the-post system, which is one that prioritises the larger parties and makes it incredibly difficult for smaller parties to have a breakthrough in Parliament. And one figure that, that illustrates this, uh, how the, this proportional of the system is, is uh, UKIP's vote share versus their seat share in the 2015 general election. So even though they got 12.5% of the national vote, they only got one out of 650 seats, although you know, it's UKIP, so I'm not too upset about that. <laughs> um, and the last time the far left had any significant representation in Parliament was in 1945, when two Communist Party MPs were elected. But since then, it's been pretty scant. Um, because of this, you know, the sort of impossibility of building a, a, left, a project to the left of the Labour Party, a reasonable number of socialists um, have remained inside the Labour Party even throughout the Blair years. The Labour Party also maintains very strong links with the trade union movement in Britain, which is another reason many socialists decided to remain in Labour, to stay connected to the political wing of the trade union movement. And the fact that, you know, these brave souls have remained in the Labour Party all throughout the Blair years meant that there were some left networks within the party um, that um, new members who were not interested in Corbyn could sort of integrate themselves into, which uh, probably helped with the process, what well, the ongoing process of democratising the Labour Party. So Corbyn was lead uh, leader for a year, and then in 2016 there was another uh, leadership election where the Blairites essentially used the Brexit vote as a stick to beat him with, and he won that again by an increased majority. But afterwards, his the project seems to be running out of steam. Um, you know, he wasn't performing particularly well in Parliament. He was constantly facing attacks uh, and calls to resign from his own MPs, from the press, and you know it, it seemed like the whole thing that we put all of our hopes in it was in jeopardy. And so, as I said last night, Theresa May used this situation whereby they had a catas like, catastrophically low poll ratings to call a general election with the plan that Labour would be right, wiped out, Corbyn be forced to stand down, and the Conservatives would be able to push forward to more austerity and hard Brexit. Um, but, as we all know, that's not what happened. Um, there was an incredible campaign, tens of thousands of young people, well, predominantly young people, People of all ages came out onto the streets, uh, doing door knocking, leafleting, postering, firing, and just to give us a sort of flavour of what the campaign was like, I'll uh, talk about uh, where I did most of my campaigning, which is a seat called Battersea in South London, where Labour's to the left candidate with an excellent record of local activism, especially around disability rights. It was a seat where the Tories had an 8,000 vote majority, and it seemed, especially at the beginning of the election campaign, when Labour uh, were very low in the polls, it, it seemed like an insurmountable challenge to win that seat. But after a series of successful campaign day events where hundreds of people turned out you know, to knock doors, as well as consistent work by the local party, we managed to achieve a 10% swing in favour of Labour and we won the seat uh, unseated. And what I felt was particularly important about, about the campaign was its fundamental strategy emulated the strategy of Labour nationally. So in contrast to previous Labour campaigns, uh, so sort of 1997 to 2010 or 2015 even, which largely took the working class uh, vote and the youth vote for granted, and instead tried to uh, focus on winning over Liberal Democrats and moderate Tories, moderate uh, Tories. Um, this campaign was very much focused on reconnecting with Labour's working class and young base, offering them policies that broke with neoliberalism and would provide a real material improvement in their own lives. And so that was the national campaign, and in Battersea, we sort of emulated this by doing most of our canvassing work in working class housing estates that have been neglected by Labour for decades. Uh, you know, just to give an example, some of the homes I visited hadn't been visited since the 1992 election, which was four years before I was born. Um, and Corbyn's platform of homes, health, education had a resonance with these communities. So the election, you know, election night came around, as I said. Uh, it's incredibly exciting, it's permanent damage to our livers. Um, <laughs> um, and it, it changed everything. It shut up the Blairites. Corbyn had momentum. Uh, in sort of that, you know, not as a new organisation, he had momentum. Um, 
and Labour achieved its first significant uh, increase in seats in 20 years. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about you know, the internal life of the Labour Party and maybe what lessons you can draw from that, contrasting with the ALP here. So as you know, we have an organisation called Momentum, which was founded uh, shortly after Corbyn achieved leadership. I think it was initially quite a positive development. Local branches started doing campaigning work and trying to turn the party in, into an activist party. But in my opinion, the organisation has <coughs> suffered a bit, becoming increasingly bureaucratic, undemocratic and centralised. It's taken a number of rightward turns. So when activists supporting an industrial dispute around the chain of cinemas tabled a motion uh, proposing that Momentum financially support the strike, the proposal was opposed, with one member of Momentum leadership citing that it would set a precedent for supporting the strikes, which is obviously a pretty uh, disappointing development. Um, and this lack of enthusiasm for grassroots self-organised activity is also seen in how Momentum, uh, the Momentum National Office operates, dictating what members should do from above. So the strategy for socialists in the Labour Party, at least those interested in the democracy and revolution, um, should be to try and turn around momentum, turn it into a bottom-up organisation that reaches out to communities and does grassroots activism work. But more importantly, it's I think one well, of the most pressing task is to do that to Labour itself. You know, even in its earlier, more radical days, Labour was never a, a party that prioritised extra parliamentary action. Um, in fact, Ralph Miliband, um, who's a Marxist academic he lived in Britain, uh, described and said that Labour was. Um, always one of the most dogmatic social democratic parties, but not about socialism, but about the parliamentary system, uh, which sort of gives an idea of what we're up against, the <coughs> levels of um, hostility towards extra parliamentary action um, within the Labour Party. <coughs> so, but we've been trying to turn this around, so there have been the setting up of local Labour, young Labour groups, which have been engaging in social movement work and trying to turn the party outwards. And then we've also been trying to do more trade union work, so our local branch has been supporting uh, uh, the industrial dispute that I just mentioned around the chain of cinemas, and we even managed to get John McDonald, the Shadow Chancellor, to come down, as well as our own local MP, which was a very encouraging development. <clears throat> we also need to be willing to criticise Corbyn from the left. Um, so often Corbyn leadership <laughs> has taken poor positions under pressure from the right, uh, from the press and the right within the Labour Party, a key example of this is the question of migration, so in the post-Brexit environment, xenophobic attitudes towards migrant workers, especially those uh, from the former Eastern Bloc countries, such as Poland and Romania, um, have developed. And shamefully, Corbyn and the unions, has often, and the unions have often taken a pro-border and anti-worker, anti-migrant worker position um, under this pressure in, in an attempt to sort of appeal to these xenophobic attitudes. Um, and in response to this, Labour Party members have uh, set up a thing called Labour for Free Movement, which is a, a network uh, which aims to promote pro-immigration politics within the Labour Party. So what's the situation now? Um, well, we still have a slightly bizarre situation where we almost operate as two parties in one. So you have the radical leadership supported by the mass membership, but then the bureaucracy and many of the elected officials, including local councillors, uh, the MPs, although uh, are still firmly on the right, although since the election the balance of the parliamentary party has been shifting uh, in favour of the left, but it's still controlled by the right. <coughs> you know, unfortunately, most of our Labour councillors aren't like Sue here, they're pretty neoliberal um, and they're very willing just to you know, push through conservative cuts. In my area, the Labour council has been responsible for shutting down 10 local libraries. Uh, yeah, it's, it's bad, and you know, setting up social housing, demolishing sort of public housing, you would call it, uh, with you know, they they say it's a you know a necessity and you have to make hard choices, but you know they could choose to resist it if they wanted to, but they don't. Um, so you know, this uh, session is titled "What Lessons Can We Draw from the Corbyn Campaign?" Uh, and something sort of prepared maybe some uh, tentative ideas about what lessons you can draw from it, although it's very important to acknowledge that this is still you know, an ongoing process and um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So 
what I've come up with is that socialist politics can win elections. Um, for decades we've been told that to have a chance in hell of being elected, you need to triangulate your policies, move further towards the right, um, and this logic um, has, you know, this idea has been played out by most of the social democratic parties in Europe, including by Labour for many years. Um, but this is proven to be completely untrue. Uh, Labour achieved its biggest swing in the vote since 1945, and its first significant increase in seats in 20 years. I think it's also interesting to compare Labour's performance with some of the other European social democratic parties that have moved right and have not um, you know, had a sort of Corbyn surge and a leftward swing. So the Parti Socialiste in France got less than 7% in the most recent presidential election, being outflanked by its left. And the Greek, Dutch and Belgian social democrats have also tanked uh, dramatically as a result of moving to the right. Another lesson is the necessity of maintaining extra parliamentary social movement work. Uh, many of the policies, this is important because many of the policies that included were included in the Labour Manifesto may not have been there if the social movements had not been demanding them for years beforehand. An example of this I mentioned last night is the free education demand. If activists from an organisation that I'm part of the National Campaign Against Feasing Cuts had not been, you know, hammering away at that demand relentlessly for the past seven years, it's questionable that it would have been included in the manifesto. Um, and it's also, you know, to make sure the movement is more democratic and free of bureaucracy, you need to start developing those grassroots uh, things. Um, so, you know, despite momentum's positive role in the election, its unwillingness to broaden out to go into communities and build autonomous local branches is hampered, uh, hampered the movement a bit, I feel. And also building social movements allows the left, it gives the left a platform to be critical of the Corbyn leadership when necessary. And the final and possibly, I don't know, most depressing for you uh, lesson is that there isn't really a silver bullet for how to get a Damn! Game. <laughs> That's what we're all waiting for. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, so it's difficult to, I don't know, maybe distill what caused the, the Corbyn surge. But I think it was a result of two things, really. So basic one, hard work on his, uh, on his behalf and the Labour left. Uh, all throughout the Blair years, maintaining himself as a you know an actual socialist within the Labour Party, refusing to give in on topics like the Iraq War, on privatisation, on benefit cuts, um, you know that really added to the authenticity of his character, which was a large part in helping uh, get him elected, um, and also a strange series of accidents. So, like I said, um, the, the change of the voting system, which blew up in the Blairite's face, him only getting. Um, <clears throat> on the ballot paper two minutes before the deadline. Um, so, you know, these things haven't happened. It was, it's questionable of the whole, you know, we would even be in the situation today. So there was, you know, a strange series of events and accidents and also a fair bit of luck. So I think uh, where will our problem come from is not really the right question to ask. And I think that the question will answer itself through working social movements. You know, it's through building these social movements that lead us like this arise, there doesn't even have to be a single person. And I think <coughs> the limiting factor of the Corbyn campaign is that it is based around a single person and not a party or a series of ideas. So um, I'm sorry if that's not particularly helpful or a bit depressing for you. Um, but I think continued work in extra parliamentary movements is basically the closest thing uh, that I can advise you to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.